I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Today, we have uh, the very first meeting of our uh, Math for Wisdom study group on the divisions of everything. Uh, we'll be giving, uh, we'll be hearing uh, John Harland give a presentation on the complex numbers. And um, that's uh, foundational for the math that we want to learn. I will um, give about 10 minutes of preliminary remarks about the divisions of everything, about the big picture that we can keep in mind of while we're thinking about the math, the philosophical ideas. But first, I'd just like to uh, welcome John Harland. Uh, John, uh, it's great to have you here. Well, it's great being here. Thank you. Let's have a round of applause for John. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'll pull up my slides. Hi to everybody. Um, so now I'm going to give a presentation of uh, what this is all about, the study group. And so uh, first I'll give about 10 minutes of preliminary remarks about opposites. The, philosophically, what do we mean when we have opposites? Then we'll, the primary, uh, the, the main part of this presentation will be interactive uh, tutorial by John Harland on the complex numbers. And then the last five or 10 minutes will be concluding discussion. As you know, this will be in two Zoom sessions of 40 minutes each. So what we're doing is uh, we are like mountain climbers. Uh, we are looking for traces of wisdom in advanced mathematics. So we don't have to learn all of mathematics, but we do have to learn certain key parts. Uh, and as mountain climbers, we're trying to get the whole big picture, okay? So one of the things, one of the mountain peaks that we're going to climb is called bot periodicity. But we're starting off in the foothills. And if you see it in the bottom uh, of this diagram, it says complex numbers. And complex numbers are like very basic, um, very natural. What we'll uh, need in order to talk about qubits, in order to talk about rotations, Mobius transformations, and such. So we're going to be climbing this mountain. Uh, and um, what I want you to be learning each time, and so each time we have a presentation, we'll always be spending the beginning learning about um, divisions of everything. And if if the ABCs are the following on the screen, you can have a two-track mind for existence, like free will and fate, where opposites coexist, but all is the same. You can have a three-track mind uh, for learning and participation. So it's a learning cycle of taking a stand, following through, reflecting, back to taking a stand, following through, reflecting. And you need a four-track mind if you want to be dealing with knowledge because um, you need to be able to think uh, whether, uh, knowing whether, knowing what, knowing how, knowing why, they have to be all involved, they have to be all related. That's what we'll always be coming back to. But those sit in a bigger system. So those are the ABCs, but you can have a more complicated uh, structure of a five-track mind uh, for decision-making, a six-track mind for morality, a seven-track mind for logic. And at that point, you get a self-standing system, okay? And uh, the, the unusual way uh, of thinking that's going on here is that we start with a contradiction, basically, like God would be a contradiction and there'd be no tracks. You know, and then what we're trying, what, what seems to be the case is that you try to go from a state of contradiction to a state of non-contradiction, you know, by having a one-track mind, a two-track mind, and all the way up to a seven-track mind. When you get to a seven-track mind, the system is so developed, it's able to be consistent. It's able to distinguish, let's say, truth and falsehood. And it's able to have what I call a self-standing opposite. So truth exists its opposite does not exist in a certain sense. You know, that's really weird. You know, what does that mean? So um, in mathematics, uh, where the goal is to show that that actually corresponds to things that we can, uh, that mathematicians uh, study that are very uh, abstract, but also concrete in mathematics. And so this is bot periodicity. It is likewise an eight cycle. And these are eight ways of choosing a subspace from a vector space. And this is a diagram. Uh, we went to a talk online by John Baez. Um, he uses diagram. I'm uh, also using his diagram. 
So he's talking about symmetric spaces. This is very deep. And But if you notice in this diagram, there's, for example, SU. Oh, well, it says U of N, but you could add an S. That, that would be make it special. But basically, U of N is something that we'll be thinking about relating to the complex numbers. O of N relates to the real numbers. SP of N relates to the quaternions. So these different types of numbers are going to be very important if we want to make this progress. Is now, to bring it back um, down to what uh, John is um, uh, going to talk about, this notion of opposites, okay? And so he'll talk about the complex numbers, but just please appreciate that those are opposites. Um, and you can think of them sometimes as identical twins, I and J, but they end up getting names like this one and that one. So you can have two identical twins, but... As soon as you call one of them this one, the other one gets to be that one. <laughs> and they say, why am I that one? Well, because you're the second one. But it's completely usually arbitrary. And we forget about that. So uh, sometimes I'll talk about like unmarked opposites and marked opposites. So like I versus J can end up being called I versus negative I. <laughs> and if you kind of notice like I is unmarked, it's the, you know, regular I, but then there's this marked I that has this negative sign mark on it, which becomes the other I, you know, and so uh, we see that, for example, even something which is more neutral, like clockwise and counterclockwise, they just seem like opposites. But if you notice, uh, the counter is saying, well, it's opposite to how the clock would normally go. So just pay attention to that. You'll certainly pick up on that today. And now, just uh, to prime our minds, to get ourselves in the mood. And this is, and also just because this is math for wisdom, we're going to sing a song. This is the awesome song. So I'm going to um, say the words and you will repeat. This is just uh, imprinting like in Sesame Street and children's television. But the imprinting is so <laughs> that, uh, the imprinting is to make it fun and just to say, it makes it real. So I'll say, ready? The awesome song. No sum. No sum. No sum. No one sum. sum. One, one sum. sum. Two sum. Two, Two sum. sum. Three sum. Three, Three sum. Four sum. Four, Four sum. sum. Five sum. Five, Five sum. Six sum. Six, Six sum. sum. Seven sum. Um, and back to the beginning, it's null sum. Null sum. No, no, no. One sum. One, one sum. Two sum. Two, two sum. Okay, so today is about the two sum for existence. Very good. You did great. So if you look at these, uh, these are, uh, and so why we've been imprinting, because now you realize this is just part of that whole eight cycle. But the point is, is that when you have a seven sum, when you have this logical system that consists of a dialogue between a mind that knows and a mind that does not know, it ends up being what you need to have an opposite like truth or like good uh, or like the way things are, you know, to be self-standing. And so it's kind of like a negative one, a self-standing opposite like a negative one. And then if you were to add another, and, you know, I won't go into all the details, but if you were to add another a leg here, uh, in the logical square, you say like all are true and all are false. Well, then, you know, or all are good and all are bad. Well, then the system must be empty. And then the whole thing collapses. So if you were to add eight, it would be empty. And so this is a way where like eight becomes zero. It's a clock. Uh, usually a clock with 12 o'clock would be zero. But here, eight o'clock is zero. That's just like bot periodicity, which is a very interesting coincidence that we'll be always having on our mind. And so the distance between... God, which is a zero perspective, dividing everything into zero perspectives and dividing everything into one perspective. Those are kind of different ways, very different ways of thinking. Like one perspective would be like zero perspectives. It's like a zero track mind. It's like a blank sheet of paper, which is kind of like a contradictory thing. Why would you have a blank sheet of paper? As soon as you mark that blank sheet of paper, it becomes marked. And that blank sheet and the mark sheet, you could think of them as opposites, that sort of say. And then what happens is that the two-sum is basically defining opposition. It's defining what you need in order to talk existence. You have to be able to talk about things that are or maybe they're not. So one of the things that we'll be looking here 
is um, the way the mind moves. So when you're when your mind is in a certain type of um, situation or context uh, and it's defined, uh, let's say with so many possibilities, then your mind can shift. So let's say your mind is reflecting on the truth. Well, then that would be kind of like being godly. But uh, so that would be like, let's say the, the, the unconscious mind just reflecting, but the conscious mind is like a perspective on a perspective. It's like a double perspective. It's like removing uh, this conscious mind. So then you would have, let's say, everything. That would be the marked opposite. And if you put it all together, if you put the unmarked and the marked, you would get this twosome. That would be consciousness. It's putting together the dialogue of these two's minds. So what this basically would mean is that consciousness of a self-standing opposite uh, by way of unmarked and marked becomes opposition. So existence is the consciousness of truth, let's say. That's the kind of equations you get. That's... Um, and then just to conclude, um, this is the final slide, but um, this twosome saying like free will and fate, opposites coexist and all is the same. That's not something we really conceive of directly. We need to make it concrete. So in making it concrete, we um, choose one of these four ways. So it could be free will versus fate. It could be opposite, outside and inside. Like if you're outside a cup, there's also an inside. But if you fall inside the cup, it's like falling inside the universe. There really isn't out, out, outside, it just keeps going. Theory and practice is like off and on. Like if a machine is off, you kind of think about it theoretically. But then if you went through the machine, you kind of experience the machine, you turned it on, then it'd be like practice. And then you and the machine are one, the opposition goes away. And then same and different, like if two cups are the same, but then they're also different. But if you notice, oh, those two cups were the same, but there's a little scratch in one. They aren't actually the same. They're they're just simply different, you know. So when they're different, they're different. So these are the types of things uh, to think about. And like with the I and J, it's very much that case, like where a complex number and its conjugate are identical. There's no difference. They're the same. But then you notice some difference or you give it a name or whatever, and suddenly they become different. They're just different. So that's enough about this. And now I'm glad to present um, our teacher for today, uh, great expositor, John Harlan. Uh, welcome. Let's see, how do I turn Thank this? Thank you. Stop Thank sharing. You. Thanks, Andres. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's wonderful being here and I'm glad to see there's so much interest. Um, and so I'm going to uh, go through a talk that I gave for my call. I teach at a college. And this was for uh, people who knew some math, but not maybe not anything beyond second year algebra. Uh, so, you know, depending on on this group, we can be interactive, and I can ask you whether I can move faster or slower. You can give give me indications, and uh, as we go along, uh, interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, and uh, so. I'll, I'll I'll go into as much detail or as little detail as you like. So any questions before we proceed? All right, let me share my screen. So this is sort of my um, my way of preparing notes. I I write part of them and then I'll I'll fill them in as we go along. But I'll I'll, uh, I'll try to uh, not just read what's on the page, but sort of explain as we go along and hopefully have a dialogue. Uh, so what are complex numbers and why are they useful? So maybe a little bit uh, more mathematic, mathematical point of view. Um, I am more of an experiential mathematician. Uh, you know, I, um, I learned math by doing it. And I don't, I don't think that I've got a global picture of why math is useful or what I'm really doing with it. You know, it's more just my set of experiences that dictates my what I what I feel is my understanding with math. So um, when I talk about math and when I talk about it on a meta mathematical level, I'm telling I'm really telling you kind of things about my experiences with math rather than a very high level point of view that Andrews aims for. So I'm I guess maybe the breakdown would be Andres is more of a theoretician and I'm more of an experimentalist in terms of 
I, I don't know. Do you think that's a fair breakdown, Andrews, or is that is is that does that miss the mark? That's fine. That's uh, I'll, okay. I'll run with it. Yeah. Okay. So the reason why I know about complex numbers is because I've used them a lot, and I found them useful in all different kinds of things. And I've just kind of uh, they, I'm I'm at home with them now, and so uh, hopefully you'll you'll be a bit more at home with them after after this talk. Uh, but it's still not going to tell you some deep philosophical reason why the real numbers are not complete, you know, in a in a philosophical sense. They're, we can talk about how they're com incomplete in the algebraic sense. Uh, but, okay, so here we go. So with those provisos, here we go. So what are the complex numbers and where are they useful? First of all, what are the complex numbers? I think we've all seen this. Uh, you want to take the square root of negative one. You cannot do it in the real numbers. So you simply posit that there is a square root of negative one. You call it I. And you then form all the numbers uh, of the form real number plus I times another real number, and you call those the complex numbers. Now we'll get into more detail about this. You know, I mean, questions arise right away. You know, can you even consistently define a number system this way? And when you do so, what are its properties? I mean, why do we even call these numbers? Aren't these just some sort of weird abstract object? So we'll, we'll get into that. Anyway, from a surface level point of view, th these are the complex numbers. They're just every single object of the form real number plus I, which we call the imaginary unit, times another real number. So for example, oh, and, and let me just define some terminology here. This is called the real part of the complex number. A is called the real part. B is called the imaginary part. I is called the imaginary unit. So an examples of complex numbers would be, for example, two plus three I. Uh, three, but three is really just three plus zero times I. Uh, negative four I is an example of a complex number. That's really zero plus negative four times I. So these are all examples of complex numbers. And of course, complex imaginary unit here, since it's supposedly supposed to be the square root of negative one, it's square better be negative one. Okay. Whenever we have a real, uh, just a real number sitting by itself, we call that a pure real number. because it doesn't have an imaginary part. And if it has an imaginary <clears throat> part just sitting by itself without the without the real part, without the A there, we call that pure imaginary. I wince <clears throat> when I say the word imaginary because I think it's terrible terminology. We'll talk about that at the end. Um, it's it's really caused a lot of a lot of cognitive dissonance throughout <laughs> throughout the ages calling it imaginary it's a it's a terrible terminology but we'll we'll try to correct it toward the end um so what is the problem with this definition the problem is that no real number can be the square root of negative one and the reason is that if you take a positive real number and square it, you get a positive number and take a negative real number and square it you get a positive number so square root of negative one can't be positive. It can't be negative. It can't be zero because when you square zero, you get zero. So it just can't exist in the real numbers. There is no real number whose square is negative one. So, but mathematicians, as we'll see, found these very useful. So I think Descartes in in the 1600s was perhaps shamed or maybe facetiously uh, kind of goaded into um, calling it the imaginary imaginary numbers, you know, pure imaginary numbers like 4i are imaginary numbers. I don't know if he had a sense of irony when he called them this, um, but, uh, and then it's stuck. It, it's this terminology that, terminology that stuck. Um, 
And we'll talk about why this is a terrible name as we go along. Um, so any questions so far? Any, any um, all right. So note that square roots of any negative numbers can be written in terms of I. So check this out. What's the square root of negative four? Well, that's just two I. And why is that? Because when you take two I and you square it and you treat I just like it, you would a real number where you can distribute the square over products, you get you get two squared times I squared. And then you get four times negative one, which is negative four. Now you may ask like, what allows me to treat a man, you know, the imaginary unit, like, like a, a normal number and distribute a power over a product. And we'll talk about that as we go along. We'll talk about what justifies these algebraic operations. Right now, I just kind of want to want to get used to, you know, using imaginary numbers for a moment. Uh, square root of negative seven eighths. So it's going to be the imaginary unit times the square root of, I'm sorry, eight sevenths. And if you want, you can simplify that uh, by rationalizing the denominator. We won't bother to. In general, the square root of negative a, where a is a positive number, can be written as i times the square root of a. So if you allow for this imaginary unit, whose square is negative one, then you can write the square, the square root of any negative number. And this originally, I think, is what motivated, uh, you know, talking about talking about complex numbers, writing the square roots of negative numbers. Okay, so why, <laughs> why on earth do we ever want to take a square root of a negative number? And the answer is that often we don't have to. And in fact, historically, we could ignore them for a very long time. Um, once we had the quadratic formula, which was known in ancient times, the solutions of this quadratic equation, it's a quadratic equation, are, of course, a familiar quadratic formula, x equals negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac. all over 2a. Now, of course, a had better not be zero, but if a is zero, then you don't have a quadratic equation. You have a linear equation. So for example, you can find the solutions of this quadratic equation just by plugging into the quadratic formula and you get a couple real roots. And you can check it just by plugging, say, those roots back into the original equation and making sure that you get zero, as we did here. Now, what about if you uh, focus on this equation? Go ahead and plug into the quadratic formula, and lo and behold, you get two complex roots. And so in ancient times, it must, you know, I, I can imagine people did this and just said, oh, this is nonsense, um, the quadratic formula. makes sense sometimes and doesn't make sense other times. So in other words, this quadratic equation sometimes has solutions and sometimes it's not. And and just to jump in, if I can, like this is an interesting example of how math unfolds or develops, like where there was a problem like um, solving a quadratic equation someone came up with, and there's different ways you could try to solve it. Like you could graph it and then you would see from the graph, it has no solutions. But someone came up with a mechanical way to solve it using the quadratic equation. And once there's a mechanical way, people can use the mechanical way without thinking. And when they use it without thinking, they come up with uh, answers that are maybe don't make sense or you know we don't know how to make sense of them. And then mathematics gets this open problem, like how do you make sense of things that it's not clear, that were generated by these rules, but it's not clear what to do with them. And that's one yeah. way that math can proceed. So here's a here's a here's uh, an example of the graph that 
Andres was just talking about. I think this is close to the graph of this quadratic equation. Let's see, his y-intercept is two. It doesn't cross, so it opens upward, so it must go down like this. And you can see that, you know, uh, the graph does not cross the x-axis, so there is no point at which y is equal to zero on that graph. Um, so, you know, it's just interesting, you know, from a solutions point of view, you can see it doesn't have a solutions by graphing it, but from an algebraic point of view, it's weird that the algebra produces these kind of weird solutions. Could you maybe just draw like the case where it does have a two solutions, negative one half and one? What would it, what oh, yeah. So, so it'd be this one right here. And this is an upward facing parabola. So, I mean, very roughly the, the graph of this going to have x intercepts at those so negative one half and one so it's going to go you know kind of like this and then we have two solutions here negative one half and at one and so yeah i mean it, it's kind of like you know a uh, maybe a, a a mathematician i can imagine being a mathematician uh 500 or a thousand years ago just saying look don't don't use this it's like you know this can this could be nonsense sometimes i mean it's useful sometimes in a case like this but it's not useful in a case like this so you know rely more on the graph to understand whether you got a solution or not why you know why put over emphasis on this formula why 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 not just put provisos on the formula and just say sometimes works sometimes doesn't and i think that Mathematicians did that for maybe a couple thousand years. Perfectly legit point of view. If it's not useful, these solutions are not useful, ignore them. So the question is, do these have any significance ever? And of course they do. Um, and we're going to get into the history of that now. Let's, let's first take a look at an example of a of sort of a, this is a pseudo uh, realistic problem. Suppose you got 200 feet of fencing. Can you use it to surround a rectangular enclosure with an area of say 2,000 square feet or 3,000 square feet? You know there's going to be a breaking point at some point. Like 200 feet of fencing is not going to say enclose a million square feet. Um, on the other hand, 200 feet of fencing, you can make a close close to zero square feet by making it very, very long, a very long rectangular enclosure and very, very narrow. You can go all the way down to zero, but you certainly can't go up to a million. So what about 2000? Can you do it? Well, you plug into this, you know, the, you, you look at this geometrically and you find out, well, the, what you're trying to say is that the area is equal to 2000. What is the area of this enclosure? Well, if the perimeter is 200, uh, then uh, the sides have to add up to 200. And this is a way of making the sides add up to 200. You say the width is x and the, and the length is 100 minus x. And then you say that the area has got to be 2,000. So you form the area equation, which is that. And that's a quadratic equation. Plug into the quadratic formula, and you get two solutions. And so, yes, it can be done. And in fact, these two solutions are really <laughs> the same solution. One's just turned on its side. So there you have it. Uh, 72.36 approximately uh, wide and 27.64 long or the other way around. So it can be done. So it's could. The quadratic equation rescues us in this case. It, it does useful work for us. What about the 3000 case? Go ahead and plug in and you get two complex solutions because the, here the b squared minus 4ac inside the root is negative. And here it was positive up here. So that's that part in there. That's your b squared minus 4ac. So when that b squared minus 4ac is negative, you get nonsense solutions. What, that, what does that mean? It means you can't do it that's all it simply means so from an algebraic point of view those solutions aren't really interesting they're just telling you you can't enclose 3,000 square feet with a, a rectangular enclosure with 3,000 square feet using 200 feet of fencing it just can't be done 
That's good. But it just means that all we have to do is throw these solutions out and say it can't be done. And in fact, this is how complex numbers I think were dealt with for, for a very long time. You know, they just meant that something was impossible. Any questions as we go along here? Okay, so can't we just say score roots of negative numbers just aren't allowed? And if, if they do arise, you just say that something's impossible, like your math, you know, model breakdown, basically. Your math is, is trying to describe an impossible situation. And of course, that's what was done historically. So I say here for the first 1500 years of I, this is pretty much how it was dealt with. But then something happened in 15, uh, 1545. Does anybody know what mathematical event took place in 1545? It actually, I think it was more important than it seems on, on the surface. It actually, I think, did change the course of mathematics. I just... You know, oh. Have an idea? And I think this is before the birth of Descartes. Does Harris know? No, I was just going to talk about Descartes. That's real now. Yeah, so, so what it is is Cardano. And it wasn't really just Cardano. It was Cardano. Um, uh, Tartaglia and Faro. Um, they were lived in the same town, and it's not clear who did what. Um, there was some dispute between the three of them. We now it now bears Cardano's name. But basically, the cubic formula, the, the analog of the quadratic formula for cubic equations, for, for equations that have cubes in them, was discovered. And then uh, that led to uh, kind of a reframing of a lot of things in mathematics. But we'll get down. We'll we're, we're going to get um, down and dirty with Cardano's formula. In particular, every cubic equation can be reduced uh, fairly easily algebraically to this form, and the roots of that equation are given by this crazy formula here. Way more complicated than quadratic formula. Involves well, cube roots, square roots. But nonetheless, it is a formula where you could just plug in and get, get solutions. And it is, uh, now I say it was a large event in mathematics. And the reason I think that it kind of struck people is that it was not discovered in, antiqu 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 antiquity. Uh, a lot of mathematics at that time was just rediscovering stuff that was done during Hellenistic times. Uh, and of course, there was the Arabic contributions to mathematics in terms of algebra. But um, like in terms of really new ideas that were just not known to the Greeks and Romans and Arabs, this stood out. Cardona, Cardona, Cardona's formula stood out. And that proved to people that new stuff could still be discovered. Um, and it's a lot more complicated. It, it, it told people, it pointed the way toward, hey, look, if we just, uh, you know, use our cognition hard enough, we can discover new stuff in mathematics. It may not look pretty. It may be complicated, but there is still new ground. There is new stuff to unearth, you know, in in body of mathematics. So that's one um, effect it had. But Let's go ahead and apply Cardano's formula. Anyway, let, let, let me go back to this timeline. You know, there, you know, the imaginary, you know, Descartes uh, called I the imaginary unit here. Um, Euler's equation, which was a big breakthrough, uh, which was based on Dumas' theorem. Uh, complex plane was talked about uh, starting the, uh, toward the early 1800s. Fundamental theorem of algebra was proven by Gauss, again, almost at 1800. And um, complex analysis sort of, um, the mature sort of applications of complex numbers start in the early 1800s. So it did take a couple centuries uh, for, you know, this whole thing to unfold. Um, it was rather mysterious for a long time what all this meant. But 
why was a, a mystery that came out of Cardano's formula? And so let's go ahead and just do an apply problem here. Suppose that we want to do in three dimensions what we just did in two dimensions. You've got a certain amount of material, say uh, glass or sheet metal or... I'm going to just jump in. What's going to happen is that the session is going to end in a few minutes. Uh, and okay. then we reuse, we'll all rejoin with the same link. I was really surprised. All I did was go to the Patreon webpage, fill in a few blanks. Uh, it was basically all automated. And there I was. I was a donor. And it, I mean, two euros a month, that's that's really nothing. Uh, I'm getting a lot out of Math of Wisdom. And I think you will too. Any comments? Any comments? I mean, do people, um, I, I imagine this is, this is familiar ground for a lot of people. Um, well, I like I like your pacing um, that okay. uh, you're walking through things that may be familiar. And now we're going to kind of go into new territory, I think so. Okay. I feel like being devil's advocate for why real is OK, but I mean, why imaginary is good terminology, but I can save that for later. Asynchronous. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, let's debate it at the end. I, I, we're going to talk about it. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll 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 uh, read a quote from Gauss, and and then I'll I'll uh, put in my two cents. But I'd like to hear your I'd like to hear your uh, uh, your ideas because I mean I, I don't know mathematical terminology is kind of is not it's funny that mathematical ideas are rigorously kind of vetted and so forth, but terminology is not. And so there's a lot of trash in mathematical terminology in general that leads to false impressions and all kinds of stuff, you know. Uh, and also we reuse mathematical notation, uh, you know. And it, so you have to know the context. It's sort of like reuse. It's sort of like a word in in a language where you have to the meaning of it depends on the context. You know, we do that all the time in mathematics. So the the notation is rather irrational, um, but. I'd like to hear why imaginary would be a good word for it, but let, let's put that off till the end. We'll hopefully, uh, I'm not sure we'll get all the way to the end today. Um, we haven't, do we have another session planned? We can, we can certainly have a part two. So let's not okay. necessarily rush. Uh, you've laid down the foundations uh, okay. with some things we've been familiar with uh, uh, and you're getting into new territory and let's feel comfortable with that. And certainly okay. we can have a second session. Um, but we'll want to end with some philosophical discussion. Okay, so we're all here. John, please continue with uh, Cardano. Okay, here we go. Okay, so suppose you want to build an enclosure, a three-dimensional enclosure, using a certain amount of area. So you can have some kind of material like glass or, or cardboard. Uh, and you've got a total area of, say, 100 square inches, and you want to enclose 50 cubic inches. So very much the three-dimensional analog of the uh, perimeter and area problem that we talked about above. And it can be done. So, you know, go ahead and, and uh, if you say that the base has to be, uh, base has to be uh, square, then you can call that dimension down there the length of the base, length of width of the base, or x. There's a certain height. So continuing with this calculation, again, any questions up to this point? All right. So the question is, can you enclose 50 cubic inches using an area of 100 square inches? You set that up and use the constraint that the area has to be 100. And that allows you to solve for the height in terms of the in terms of the length of the base and uh, using the volume is equal to 50, you get this and it turns into a cubic equation. You have to solve a cu cubic equation. Luckily we have Cardano's formula. So we just plug in to Cardano's formula and we end could you up slow, with- Could you slow that down just a little bit just to uh, oh, show sure. how you got the cubic equation? So you're oh. assuming that the base is square, right? So that'll right. be X times X and, but the yeah. height could be whatever. That's your, your That's you're trying right. to figure out what the height is. Um, the volume, you're trying to see if the volume could be 50 and the area is a, could be 100. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And the area, the area formula gives us 
uh, a link between H and X. If X increases, H has to decrease. Okay, and just to slow it down, so there's uh, six sides to that box, and two of the sides are square, and those will be X squared. So that's two X squared. Is that's that right. right? That's right. And then four of them are uh, rectangular, and each rectangle is XH, so that's four XH. Yes. And those are all the surface area, and when you combine all six sides, you'll get 100. That's, that's the right. first formula, right? Yeah, that's right. And then um, then the volume will be um, x squared, x times x times h is the volume, right? Right. Okay. So then that, oh, but see, but then then you're solving for h. Uh, we're we're substituting, uh, at, we're su substituting for h, uh, in terms of x, and you're just using the volume formula, which is this right here. Once you do that oh. substitution. And that gives you a cubic equation in X. Okay, so you Trying use X squared H. You use X squared H to get. Uh, how did you solve for H? Oh, uh, using the using the area constraint. Oh, the right area here. constraint. Okay, so you got four X H minus four X H equals one hundred minus two X squared, and then you divide it by a uh, four. You divide it by four X. I see. Yeah. And then you plug that in. And so then you converted it all into X squared and you got this equation X cubed, right? Minus 50 X plus 100. Right. That's okay. Right. Just slowing you down. That's what I'm, you can tell, you can tell Andres is a good mathematician because he doesn't believe anything he, he looks at. No, I'm a good mathematician that's because right. I understand when I don't understand. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. That's right. Down. Yeah. It's, it's, it's infuriating to look at something that someone else has derived. Maybe just, and maybe just to say um, a general principle that you know, this is now three dimensions. Now you're having like two different constraints. You know, you have the surface area, you have the volume, and you have two equations, basically. And you have two unknowns. Uh, you you did a slick thing by insisting that the bottom is square. So then you could, you know, it's not X, Y, H, it's X, X, H. So you have two variables, you have two unknowns. You should be able to solve for one of the variables which you are, and get down to an, one equation in one unknown. But the crucial so, thing being, so you have x cubed minus 50x plus 100 equals zero. That's the form. That's right. That's the a, that's, that, that's a crucial thing. Is that it, it boils down to a uh, cubic equation. And of course, we're going to plug into this crazy formula, Cardano's formula. And when we do that, again, you'll have to take, take my word for it that these are the computations. And... And look what happens. Something really interesting happens that doesn't happen with a quadratic formula. You get some, you know, work out these, work out these roots. But even as you do that, you were noting the the i is in the in the second yes. row there, right? That's like, right. I comes into the intermediate computations, even though the the final answers. Um, Are so I'm gonna I'm sorry I oh and the the final answers are kind of interesting because there's three possible answers for x and two of them are positive and one is negative. Let right? me... So that was curious. So when you had the quadratic equation, you had two possible answers for the length. One now that kind of made sense because it was a rectangle, so the rectangle had two different uh, sides of two different lengths. So you should have two answers. And, you know, you could, you could depending on how you oriented the rectangle, that's the answers you get. Now with this box for the X, um, you were getting three possible answers. Yes. It, 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 it's kind of interesting is that you get three. Let's hope, hope this is stable now. And the question uh, is, are they real? Three answers. Sorry about this. It's uh, but okay. so what's interesting okay. there is that two of the numbers answers were real. That means that they it suggests that they could make sense. But the other answer was negative. Like what would a right. negative length mean for a box? Right? Right. And so the fact that a negative length 
So who has any ideas with regard to that negative length for a box? What's going on? Um, there? So, no, that's a, it's actually kind of interesting why you got a negative number there. I'm just, sorry, computer problems, task manager. Maybe someone can give me some advice here. Um, well, I think, I think what, what's showing up in my... Mm, I mean, this is... I'm so excited for today, all the people yeah. who've come and for you. And I know this is a very good talk and it's really getting interesting. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and so this is godly, something God is kind of doing. I'll give, yeah. Let me, let me go we'll out. Do a, and... We'll do a, we'll do a five minute social break. You can. Yeah, that's okay. All right. And so we can, while, while John's doing that, we can catch up on news. How is everybody? Maybe I just want to say I'm doing fine. Uh, this is my last day in Oneonta, New York. Uh, tomorrow I take a bus to Washington, D.C. Um, and just to say that uh, I was so excited that so many of us joined for today, and you can see that, uh, well, John's, uh, John's a lovely uh, teacher, and, uh, and I have real hopes for our study group. Um, so just thank you for being here. Uh, it really gives a lot of ideas for the future. I'm thinking of looking for funding for this, uh, to say, like, we could do a couple of... Uh, you know, for $1,000 a month, I could ask a funder to fund uh, me to organize it. I'd get half the money, let's say, and then someone like Francis or John could get, uh, let's say, $250 for like doing a presentation like this. Obviously, we would work on the um, technology a bit, but, uh, but the idea being that to have once a month at least to have a... a on the basic, this is the basic level. This is like for high school teachers or high school students. And then one on the advanced level uh, for graduate students. And if you take the basic level, you're allowed to, you know, sit in on the advanced level. But to uh, to do uh, these types of uh, math adventures that relate to the cognitive frameworks. What do you think about this? I see smiles. Ryan is smiling. <laughs> I we think it's do a it good all, idea. Let's do it all it's in exciting. Ukrainian. Let's do it all in Ukrainian. That's a good one. <laughs> That'd be fun. Oh, and another thing that I'm thinking of doing, um, I'm thinking I'll, I'll be visiting Kirby. I'm very excited about that um, in Portland. And hopefully uh, we'll connect with Dave Gray, but maybe we could somehow connect with Ryan in Oregon because you're you're not far away. Think about how to do that. But um, there is the Summer of Math Exposition 3 contest. So this is a contest for videos. You know, I encourage Ryan or Kirby or anybody who wants, or Harris, anybody wants to make a math uh, video to do that. Um, but I'm thinking of doing one to kind of uh, promote our study group um, and to do one about... Um, uh, I have this thing where I can use five points to draw four dimensions. It's based on the simplexes. And this idea, um, uh, you know, based on Pascal's triangle and how that uh, to compare that with, let's say, coordinate systems. So the, the philosophical choice of whether a vertex exists or does not compared to the choice of whether you turn left or turn right, it turns out the same numbers, but it's very different philosophically. Um, and it's the difference between there being an observer or there not being an observer. This may be too hard, but to make a video about that. So I'll probably give a presentation about that uh, with slides and stuff. And then we'll use that to make a video, uh, you know, kind of like uh, highlighting that. So maybe we'll do acting and stuff like that. Are, are, are any of you interested in acting? Like with wearing costumes or, or is Bill and Bill's an actor? Yes. Okay. Hey, Andres, can you hear me? Yes, are you all on your new computer? I am, yep. Yeah. I'm all revved up on this. And so, so we went ahead and did this. And you rightly said, Andres, that there are, when you plug in with all these, uh, with this formula, you get two solutions, uh, positive solutions and a negative solution. I believe that should be a decimal point there. Um, and so the negative solution, I mean, what do we say? We just say that that is model breakdown, that cannot happen. But we do have these two positive solutions. 
And when you, uh, you know, use those for X and you solve for H, you end up getting two boxes now of different dimensions that have the right area and the right volume. And so, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of nice that uh, we we were just using a mechanical formula and it came up with these um, very unlikely dimensions of a box. But there's something else about this computation that's a, a little bit fishy. Can anybody see there's there's something very strange going on with this computation that does not happen with a quadratic formula? Look at the steps to this computation. That looks good. There's a simplification step and then the final step. Now, the final step is pretty easy to interpret. What about that intermediate step here, the middle step? Has anybody noticed something going on in that middle step? Can you all hear me? I can hear you. OK. I can hear you. There's something happening in that middle step that is that is rather weird. Okay, well, look at our friend. Our friend, the imaginary unit is being used in even though the final answers are real. In other words, to use Cardano's formula, what people noticed and, and what I think disturbed them was that you had to use complex numbers in the intermediate computations. Now, the quadratic formula, if you ever have to use complex numbers, the solutions will be complex. And you could just throw them out. You just say it's impossible, model breakdown. Cardano's formula, you can get intelligible, useful solutions like we do here, 5.696 and 2.218 but you have to use complex numbers in the intermediate steps. Now for a field theorist, uh, what's going on here is that you have to adjoin complex roots in your field to get to the roots that you want, which even which are real roots in this case. And John, I think I think there's something there's something maybe to explain that um, you see, the question is like, why do you get three answers? So for example, in the quadratic equation, you get two answers because it says plus or minus, right? Like, yeah. you know, uh, negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus four AC over two A. Oh. So there's this plus or minus. So the question is now, why do you get three answers? And I'm oh, so suspecting, but maybe you'll explain. Yeah, it has to do with cube roots, What, how you, how you interpret what are cube roots. Yeah, and see now, the interesting thing about cube roots, uh, and this builds on what you were saying, see, like a positive number has a one cube root uh, that's positive. A negative number has also one cube root that's negative. But really, uh, it has also two extra complex cube roots. And certainly, like a complex number would have three cube roots, right? Yes. Is that right? That's, that's why right. you're getting three Real answers. Numbers. A real number can, has one real root and two complex real roots. I mean, yeah, two complex, complex roots. real roots. Yeah. That's something. Yeah. And so, and a complex, complex number will also roots. have three roots, right? That's right. And that's why you're getting three answers. I think that's not yeah. maybe not so clear from the formula. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's right. So you actually have to use those eyes uh, in a, uh, or even if there wasn't eyes, you'd still have to use them. Um, you'd have to use, the yeah, you'd have to use some formula. kind of a system outside the real numbers to get at those roots. And when you add them together, the the, the complex parts cancel. Mm -hmm. But you you somehow, in some kind of weird magical, magical uh, way, you had to you had to take those into accounts to use this mechanical formula. Now you might just say, well, this is. Okay, so the intermediate computations involve some kind of non-mathematical thing, you know, but, uh, and the hope would be that maybe they go away if you had a deeper way of looking at Cardano's formula, well, they didn't go away. You know, this this formula, you know, there's really, um, I believe there's no other formula that will give you uh, the roots from, from the, I mean, I'm just guessing here, but there's probably no other formula that doesn't somehow use some kind of of uh 
objects that are outside the real numbers. You have to extend your number system in some way. So um, look, quick question here. You're basically saying there's no other way to solve that problem mathematically than using Cardona's formula or something you as simple well, as that. Certainly, you could do it if, if you wanted to use graphical techniques. You could you can you do it iteratively. Oh, iteratively. <laughs> yeah, you could use Newton's method. You know, to yeah. zoom in on it, but it's not. That's not math. You know, that's again an iterative. It's not an algebraic. It's not a mechanical. It's not like right because that that doesn't yeah. require no no it yeah definitely definitely is. yeah absolutely you can you can use okay. other. Geometric, iterative, uh, and I'm sure there's probably other ways of doing it. There's probably, um, yeah. Uh, I don't want I don't want to overstate things. I'm just saying if there's a mechanical formula like this where you're just plugging in and grinding in a in a finite kind of way, um, I believe you're going to have to extend your number system. I mean that that's just my my basic okay. intuition says that you're going to have to go outside the real numbers in some way. Um, so, you know, something happened, you know, not only did Cardano's formula kind of strike people that there's new mathematics, but also showed that you've got to do these funny computations outside the real numbers in order to get even real number solutions. Now, you might just get three complex solutions. If you've got three complex solutions, it would tell you that you cannot enclose that volume using that area. But here we got two real solutions, a negative solution. We threw out the negative solution and we still had to use complex numbers. So you couldn't really ignore complex numbers anymore. They start kind of asserting themselves into mathematics with Cardano's formula. Okay, so how do you make sense of a system that has the square root of negative one in it? In particular, there, there is a, a little bit of cognitive dissonance here that if you throw in something like the square root of negative one, you might completely goof things up. Um, and here's an example where you can throw in something that might be useful, but it completely screws up the number system. For example, I want to divide by zero. So I'm going to define K to be, oops. I'm going to define K to be one over zero. Why not? I mean, can't you just do anything you want and just sort of work with it? So if you want to treat K like a number, I mean, you can do this, but my argument is you cannot treat K like a normal number because if you do, here's what happens. Any questions before we continue here? If K is a normal number, then zero times K, you can write is zero times one over zero. And if it's just like treating things like normal numbers, you can cancel those zeros and get one. But you can also prove that zero times anything, because zero is the additive identity, if this is a consistent number system, it has to be zero. Thus, zero is equal to one. In this number system that in that allows for one over zero, you have to admit that zero is equal to one. <laughs> but then all numbers are equal to one another. For example, we have the equation five equals five. And then all you have to do is add <clears throat> two equal numbers, zero on the left side, one on the right side. And just go ahead and add these together by the additive property of identity, you get five on the right and six, I'm um, five on the left, six on the right. That means five is equal to six. And then you could add again and get five is equal to seven. Then you have to admit that every number is equal to every other number. You can extend this logic to anything, the equality of any two numbers. 
And so if you don't mind all numbers being equal, then by, me, by all means, uh, you can use one over zero and treat it like a number. But if you are, find that to be, um, make your number system useless, which I think most of us would, then you you have to draw the line and say that this is not a normal number. Now, we do call, you know, in, in analysis, we call this an extended real number. It doesn't enjoy the full properties of all the real numbers. Um, but uh, but it it is going to throw a wrench in the number system and you cannot treat it like a normal number if you want if you want other properties of your number system to hold up. So you can't just throw anything you want in. So how do we know this doesn't happen when we introduce the square root of negative one? And so this gets into sort of the details of how you define number, number systems. So here's the formal definition of the complex numbers. Um, we're gonna write the complex numbers as ordered pairs. We're just going to define this quote unquote number system. And for those of you, I know that, um, Jerry, I think you like quaternions. I'm gonna give you maybe even a better definition of qu complex numbers in a moment. Uh, just, but just, uh, just hear me out for a moment. Uh, complex numbers are just gonna be pairs of real numbers. So, okay, it's an object, it's a mathematical object. And how do you define addition? You have to, these are numbers, you have to define addition. So A, B plus C, D is equal to any ideas how we should add those ordered pairs to, in a consistent way to be able to, for us to add ordered pairs? A plus C and B plus D. Yeah, just add, add the two first uh, components and add the two second components. So for those of you who have a picture of this in the plane, that's just vector addition. Multiplication is a little weirder. A little more exotic. How are you going to multiply two numbers? Well, uh, I mean, you can imagine this is A plus BI, C plus DI, and then just use the distributive property. You get A, B, you get A times C minus B times D for the first component, and then you get um a, D plus B, C for the second. I think that's correct. Maybe maybe show how that comes out from the distributive. Uh, yeah, model. so yeah. I mean, it, you know, the motivation here, if you, you know, we're thinking of this in the background, although we're not defining our complex numbers this way, we're thinking that, you know, A plus B times I, and then C plus D times I, and then using the distributive property, Like foil. Mm -hmm. Foil, yeah. And then you get A times C. And then you get uh, B times D times I squared. And then you get A times D times I plus B B I times C. So I can be written as B times C times I. And then collecting all the like terms here, I squared is negative one, so you get AC. Well, the real part becomes AC minus BD. My computer, this computer is even taking a little vacation on me. Okay. And we'll be... Um... We have maybe like one minute from for you, John, like to. Ah, OK, so maybe. maybe and just, then we'll have like maybe, maybe five minutes just for discussion. But um, OK, but so basically well, maybe, you've shown is that point. this is, is my, the, this makes this is my stylus is, have AC my stylus is taking a vacation. D, uh, for the real part and you have uh, AD plus BC for the imaginary part. And I know you have a lot more to say, but so hopefully there'll be a part two. Is that right? There is a part two. Uh, maybe what I should do is uh, just give you a preview. We're going to go ahead and argue that these are this is a consistent number system. Uh, we're going to visualize the complex numbers as points in a plane rather than points on a line. 
And uh, then I'm going to show you, you know, some things you can do complex numbers. And I think that the most salient for our point of view, since we're trying to work toward an understanding of SU2, is that complex numbers help you model periodic phenomena because there are natural periods in the complex numbers where you can take a complex number and multiply it by itself again and again and go in a circle. And you don't have natural periods like that where you repeat the same algebraic operation again and again in the real numbers, but you do in the complex numbers. And this is, I think, the primary algebraic reason why complex numbers are used to model waves. So this is what I'm what I'm getting at is the complex numbers have this more complicated structure, but then they've got these kind of beautiful periods embedded in them that that allow you to naturally model periodic phenomena, which are, to me is the most interesting application of complex numbers. So that's giving you a a little uh, preview. And uh, so I think, uh, are we gonna wrap it up? Well, so why don't we give a round of applause for John for this presentation, the very first uh, study group. Uh, and then uh, thank you. And then um, maybe uh, we have five minutes left. If everyone could um, maybe say what you liked about the presentation or what you think about the complex numbers. Uh, and how could we make this more interactive? Uh, so who would who would first uh, start? Uh, Kirby, maybe. Well, I'll just uh, inject my why I think imaginary is an okay term. It's once you've already bought that we have real numbers. It's that word real that really sets the stage for we need something related to real, but not real. And there are only so many words mm -hmm. To connote that and beyond real, anti real, unreal, we could have called them unreal, but what's unreal? Imaginary. So it's okay, it's logical. Okay. Okay. For uh, some reason, I, I can't share my video. I, I, I'd uh, project my video, but I can't do it right now. Um, that's fine. I'm having multiple computer problems. Harris, Harris, do you have a comment? Or? <clears throat> question. Uh, yes, thanks for a really nice presentation despite the computer problems. I was just wondering whether or I suppose we can discuss this in the next meeting, like where does zero fit in? Is it complex? Is it real? Is it imaginary? Or is it just the origin? I don't know if that applies to uh, infinity as well, like as a concept. But zero just troubled me when I was seeing that. It's it's the it's the intersection between the reals and the and the and the imaginaries. They they have one oh. they have one number in common. So zero is real and zero is complex, and so as a complex number, it would be zero plus zero i would be the full first name last name. Type yeah. Of thing. So zero gets to live in both worlds. And infinity can also be added, like uh, you can sometimes add uh, infinity to the complex numbers, like to make a ball out of it. So like you well, take it all. We're going to do that, we're gonna do that to, when ball. we extend That's it. a very important concept. Yeah. Three months when we extend to SU2, we will do that. That's going to be very important. Um, but part of our problem with zero is that it sometimes is used as a placeholder, sometimes as an origin, sometimes as yeah. a boundary, sometimes as a number. And that all gets confused. The, the, the and there's something problem. special I've been talking with John about. I've tried to write some emails about it. Where like, you can think of an action where you're taking a number through the complex plane, and it has a certain orientation. You know where you're going clockwise, counterclockwise, in pairs. But if you pass it through zero, you kind of want to say that the orientation switched, right? So there's something magical about passing through zero where it becomes like a window or a mirror, like where you switch over. And I, I would still have to convince people like Thomas that that makes sense, but but um, zero is any. Other comments? Uh, Ed, my father, Edmundus, do you have a comment? Yes, thank you very much, John. Let's go. Kind of oh, Ed, I, I, I saw your name uh, and I didn't I didn't realize that you were Andres's father. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, nice to see you. It's been a long time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, I thought it was, your presentation was uh, quite interesting, uh, good examples, but uh, I'd like to see and hear more about other applications of these imaginary numbers. Yeah, I was going to get to that at the end. Waves, uh, and circuit theory. That would be interesting. 
Yeah, so like uh, transfer functions and circuit theory, that's one of my favorites. Um, mm -hmm. Got processes, you, periodic solutions. Yeah, forward to other. Yeah, so so yeah, there's there's lots of you know there's billions of applications and my my favorite are really periodic phenomena uh, and I give it I give examples of why using complex numbers really simplify the mm -hmm. the discussion of periodic phenomena waves and things like that. Um, so um, we have like forty seconds. I just want to thank uh maybe say a prayer of thanks like for everybody here like just the energy that you know we've gotten to know each other we're all here from different parts of the world it means so much to me to think we're on the verge of learning how to work together we'll try to do things um to make it uh participatory more friendly but you can see john certainly had a lecture where he tried i really wanted to get my wondrous wisdom in the beginning i'll have to think but um but you can see that that's maybe important to keep returning to that. You know, I'll keep trying to be inventive. So maybe we all wave, wave goodbye and uh, and we disappear. Yeah. And we will meet again for part yeah, two. Yeah, we will meet again. Yeah, great yeah. seeing everybody. Definitely.